survive the first snow. Okay, maybe we should start and uh, any latecomers will be welcome to disturb us and find their seats. Hello, my name is Mona Philip and I'm the director curator of the Coffer Gallery here at the Coffer Center of the Arts, actually across the hallway over there. Um, on behalf of the Coffer, I would like to welcome you all here today, acknowledging the indigenous peoples in Ontario whose history um, goes back for thousands of years on this land. Thank you so much for joining us today um, for this panel discussion that uh, we hope will be a really engaging conversation on an issue uh, that we find is quite crucial uh, to the current moment, um, the question of how to create an inclusive society. Uh, we've gathered here a diverse panel of diverse perspectives, but um, the thing we all have in common up here <laughs> is that we're all newcomers to Canada. Um, some have been here longer than others. Um, and we're going to discuss this question within artistic practices, uh, looking particularly at the role that the arts and artists and art institutions can hopefully play in um, developing this notion of inclusiveness and, and changing society for the better. Um, the panel is inspired by the themes that we're exploring in our current exhibition, Yonder, which um, I'm hoping you've seen or you'll take a moment to see maybe after the discussion. We're actually going to have um, our new um, newcomer volunteer docents. Um, it's a program that we've begun in partnership with Culture Link, um, and they will be here to share their own perspectives on the work um, in the exhibition. So stay for a conversation afterwards. Um, 
the exhibition, um, I've curated it in, in collaboration with my colleague Matthew Brower from um, U of T, University of Toronto, and it includes um, a group of Canadian artists, um, about 16 of them, who are actually here in the audience, uh, Louis Jacob, whose work you can see up there, um, and Julius Manapol. Thank you for joining us. And the idea was to explore um, the experience of immigration from subjective, personal perspectives and to engage with the larger political perspectives through this subjective lens. Um, the artists are exploring um, how their identity gets translated, negotiated, reconfigured in the space between a culture or multiple cultures that they've lived in, uh, that they've now arrived to and integrating to, um, but at the same time they offer critical perspectives that we think are really important in hopefully affecting change in society at large. So, to begin with our panel, um, I've asked everyone to do a little bit of an introduction to give you a background on um, the work they're doing and how it's related to, to these main questions that we're addressing. One of the artists in the exhibition is also on the panel, Surinder Daliwal. Um, she is a Toronto-based artist who was born in the Punjab and was raised in London, England, and has lived in Canada since 1968. She was educated both in the UK and here in Canada and she has had numerous exhibitions um, all across the country and internationally. So I will ask Surinder to tell us a little bit more about her work. Um, uh, it's, okay, it's on. <laughs> um, that's such a big question, but I think that uh, my work has always been um, uh, rooted in autobiography. and. One of the things that I think I've tried to do with my work is to use it as a psychological space um, to fix things that uh, were unfixable for me when I was a child. Um, I work across many disciplines, um, but I think my work is very um, thematically cohesive. Uh, so today I'm going to start with um, a couple of minutes uh, from a short film that's from 2010 called Olive, Almond and Mustard. And uh, those are colours, but they're also um, oils that are used to um, oil children's hair in India and sometimes in other countries where they would prefer that their hair was not oiled. Um, but sometimes it's your parents who decide how you're going to how much you're going to assimilate into your new country. Some people regard him simply as a racist, others as honestly reflecting the views of his constituents. But the Enoch Powell, who acted in the race relations bill to a match thrown onto gunpowder, said that immigration should be virtually stopped. The minister responsible for race relations has called Mr. Powell's speech extremely bad. Powell's speech was splashed across the Sunday papers, and we will trace the source of Powell's rivers of blood to his wartime service in India, and to his burning ambitions for the Viceroy of India, and following the footsteps of the illustrious Victorians and the Edwardians who had held that office. It's very much in the of the um, so as you can hear, the soundtrack is multi-layered, and um, one of the uh, threads in that multi-layering is um, a very famous speech made in 1968 by Enoch Powell, who was a conservative politician in Britain, and it's become known as the Rivers of Blood speech. Because in 1968, he said that if um, coloured immigration wasn't curbed in Britain, there would be rivers of blood um, on, on the streets of, of Britain. Um, and what never amazes, what never fails to amaze me is how 
the language has not changed. So that was 1968. Um, we've just had an election where there was similar language. Um, so the film was really about myself and my mother. She was illiterate and uh, she insisted that um, if she didn't oil our hair, we would go mad. And she said the sun would burn down and, uh, well, burn our scalps, but it was Britain of the 1950s when um, the smogs would come down and 8,000 people would die in four days. There was no sun. Um, I'm going to show uh, a couple of slides, um, rather images. Slides don't exist anymore. And this is a piece that's, um, that Louis Jacob, who is in the audience, uh, he's curated a show. It's at the U of T Art Center. And he uh, chose this piece. Um, so again, it's related to my childhood. Um, my mother would always say, you have to call this person this, and you have to call that person that. And I would say, but why? And she would say, well, you just have to. She never explained it to me. And I think that one of the um, real problems with um, uh, intergenerational dissonance, if you like, is that um, children require a rational reason to be told to do something. And These if they were just family members, mm -hmm. right? These were family members. Yes, that yeah. That had specific names. Yeah. And... So in the Punjabi language, and I imagine in many Asian languages, there are a number of words for, for example, aunt. So um, there are six in the Punjabi language, your mother's sister, uh, your mother's brother's wife, mm -hmm. your father's sister, your father's older brother's wife, and your father's younger brother's wife. And that's a very simplistic one. It gets much more complicated when it's an in-law married to an in-law. Um, and I think that one of the things I do is I make my work for myself. I am the primary audience. Um, and I hope that it can, um, I hope that my work can reach across cultures because there are, um, there's a universality in it too, even though it's very specific. And so with this particular piece, um, when I saw it at the U of Art, Art U University of Toronto Arts Centre. Art Museum. At the University museum. Of Toronto. <laughs> um, I guess I'm still in the old days, like a year ago. So um, I looked at it and I thought, okay, I made that in, I think it's 80, 89 or 90. Um, but I imagined uh, a student or some students of South Asian background um, coming into the art center and seeing something that actually they knew more about than maybe the other students coming in. I think we'll go on to the last. Um, and what's in the little bowls? Oh, um, it's cut, it's powdered pigment, and the bowls are made of coconuts. So often I work. Um, it was my birthday, and we're talking many, many, many years ago. And my brother worked at the food terminal, and he said, "What would you like for your birthday?" And I said, "I'd like twenty-eight coconuts." <laughs> And they just, I just kept them until I think they were right for this piece. So it doesn't have much meaning. It's mostly an aesthetic counterpoint to the slates. So uh, this is the piece that's in um, Yonder. And uh, it's a new piece um, this year. And when Mona asked me to participate in this show, you know, I went through all kinds of things like Maybe I could research a family living on Shore Street and they would have come from Portugal. And, um, and in the end, I decided that uh, I wanted to, um, if I could magic things, I would magic a different kind of weather for us. And I'm sure that you'll agree today would have been, in my world, 
the snow isn't going to come for another uh, five weeks. So I'm sure as we um, uh, go along, there'll be you know an interlinking between our um, presentations, and they'll be able to ask more questions. Thank you. Next on the panel, we have Jimena Luisi, who is a Venezuelan theater artist who has been living in Canada for the past seven years and in Toronto for the last three. She's a graduate of Fanshawe College's theater arts program in London, Ontario, and has trained with a number of companies and artists in both Venezuela and Canada. Do you want to tell us more about it? Hi. Hello? Yeah. Hello. Hi. Um, really? How does this? You can just switch places. I'll just hold it. No, I will. I'll just. Sorry, Okay. Hi. Um. Yeah. So my name is Jimena, and I was born and raised in Venezuela. And um, my family came to Canada uh, seven years ago. Uh, on the first wave of what has since become the largest migration outward that Venezuela has seen in its in its history because of the everyone crisis that we're in. Um, for me, at the tender age of 19 and um, very uh, angsty artist, my migration was very much about the possibility of being able to train in a craft that I couldn't pursue professionally in my country. Um, so the work that I do now, seven years into coming to Canada. And there's something very specific about, for me in my history, um, I landed in Canada and 10 days later, I turned 20 years old. So I was never really an adult in Venezuela and I have never been a young Canadian. Um, so the, the, the clean separation of like what I am as an adult woman and a Canadian woman um, is very important to me in, in the work that I do now. I'm gonna read you a quote from a play um, by Aristides Vargas, who's an Argentinian playwright who actually lived in Venezuela for a lot of time. And he deals with a lot of um, subjects of exile and longings and uh, identities around the world. I'm gonna read it to you in Spanish and there's the translation behind me. So it goes like this. El frío ha cambiado mis facciones. Este nuevo país ha desfigurado mi rostro. Estoy parada exactamente en la esquina donde hace 50 años un compatriota se prendió en fuego porque estaba triste y no resistía a haber perdido el paraíso. Se prendió fuego y su calor no alcanza para devolver las facciones de mi cara. So, I, I bring you this quote because for me, and I'm just in the process of transitioning from, I came and I trained as a performer, um, and I'm, I'm more in the process of claiming my place as a creator and theater maker. Um, and so in the process of that transition over the last two years, I've had the, um, the blessings of being able to work with Aluna Theater, um, who is a, a predominantly Latino company. Um, we just in October had the amazing privilege of bringing seven Latin American companies and one indigenous company from New Zealand um, to the Daniel Spectrum uh, for the Rutas Festival. Um, and so for me, um, that wasn't in it. That's a different show, but uh, that's me. Um, for me, uh, the, the important thing about this, this quote is that it references two things that are very pivotal in my work and in my exploration as a diaspora, diasporic artist. And I've, I'm in conflict with that word because there's so many... Um, feelings around it so it seems very like in my art for a while it just it seemed like it's such a strong calling and such a juicy place to explore from and then often when I talk to more seasoned artists I hear things like all art is diasporic art just do the work and uh, and don't worry about whether it's about this or that and so as I as I unravel all of these things and this is really I'm just at the door of all of these subjects and so I'm speaking from a place of, of what my questions are as a as an emerging really artist. Um, the, 
our our what is the word that is says features features that word's really hard for me in English. Our features are disfigured by the cold, and they are. Uh, I came to Canada, and I did so well at assimilating into an Anglo centric um, theater program and a very very white community in London, Ontario. Um, and and I think that's something that we all do to a, to a different degree, but I think it's important that we look at that because whether we are pleased by our assimilation or wounded by it or either. Um, it is the staple of the work that it, it is what makes our work diasporic, whether we are choosing to name it that or not. Um, and then there's the fact that she references um, a compatriot that lit himself on fire 50 years ago. So the fact that migration has always been a part of our history and the things that we're going through, all migrants have been going through. Um, and so there's a there's a connection to this this struggle and to the building of these these societies that goes further back, and the longing is very different. So uh, her compatriot set himself on fire because he couldn't cope with having lost what he had. So it's a compatriot that regrets and 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 blames and then surrenders. Whereas her regret is that she, even that he cannot make her what she was. And so it's the fact that right now for me, after spending five years assimilating and training and really grasping a culture and an aesthetic here in Canada, I'm looking to the South um, to see what it is that my art actually is past all of the disfiguration that my factions have gone through. Um, while knowing that it'll, it won't be a returning to what I was um, and that a returning to what I was isn't useful for, for what we are trying to build. What's useful is um, an offering and an acceptance of, of what it is that we become after the process of migration. The play that you saw, the pictures that you saw were from a play by an amazing uh, Chilean uh, Canadian artist, Via Bruxa. She is a visual artist and um, this show is called Ayelen and it was presented at Summerworks 2015. Um, and it dealt with, um, very briefly, it dealt with the abuses in that occur in the mines in Guatemala to their indigenous people. And um, it was a very rough, um, poignant story told through fable and through magical realism. And it was, it's the kind of work that aesthetically we don't see often here. It was told very much in a child, in a children's kind of fairy tale um, script. Uh, and it was the first work that I did that really put me in a place of saying there can be work that is different. And so that is why it's there. Thank you. Shrimoy Mitra is a curator and writer. She has worked as the art writer for publications in India, such as Time Out Mumbai and Art India magazine. She was the programming coordinator at SABAC, South Asian Visual Arts Center, in Toronto between 2008 and 2011. And she is now um, the curator of contemporary art at the Art Gallery of Windsor since 2011 and I'll let her speak more to the kind of exhibitions and programs that she's implemented there. Thank you, Mona. Um, thank you for having me on this panel. It's um, a great, uh, great honor. Um, and um, it's really lovely because I feel um, there are so many parallels with, uh, you know, with everything, <laughs> um, with what you've said, Surinder and Neil um, uh, and this notion of a work being autobiographical. Um, and uh, really, it's in the last couple of years that I realized, wait a second, this is, uh, you know, it has a real the work that I'm doing and, you know, the research that I've always been propelled to do is, uh, has always been, uh, 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 is autobiographical and um, um, very closely linked to my own personal histories. So um, I had the privilege of coming to Canada uh, as an international student from Bombay, from Mumbai in India um, in 2000. <coughs> Um, and I've sort of uh, gone back and forth since. Uh, I never, I resisted uh, becoming a citizen uh, for a long time, and I guess I'm not a citizen of Canada as yet. Um, so, uh, you know, this notion of, uh, and I have, a, and now that I've been here for about 15 years, um, you know, I'm obviously not the 18 year old who left, uh, who moved from, uh, from Bombay. And actually I've lived here for most of my adult life, although I, went back and worked and lived in India for a bit. 
and then move back. So, um, you know, uh, so thinking about whether I'm Indian or Canadian or what those things mean are constantly in flux. And actually, um, uh, you know, uh, I don't know if it's, I think it's an, an ongoing process uh, of trying to figure that out. Um, and I don't even know if those labels are actually important or how important they are uh, um, and at what point they're labels and at what point they're nationalistic. Uh, those are all questions that uh, I think, especially in this moment, uh, we need to grapple with. Um, so one of the projects that uh, Mona had asked me to speak about uh, was uh, this exhibition uh, that I uh, developed uh, in uh, Windsor at the Art Gallery of Windsor called uh, Border Cultures. Um, so Border Cultures was a three-year exhibition um, that took place from 2013 to 2015. Um, I moved to Windsor in 2011 to take the position of Curator of Contemporary Art, um, and I was really struck by um, Windsor, you know, uh, being at the southern tip of Canada across the river from Detroit. I could not believe, um, so, sorry, if we could go back to the previous image, no, the one before. <laughs> so this, uh, this was the view from my office, and actually I live very closely, uh, close to the gallery, um, and so this is our view from our window. So what we're looking at um, across the river is Detroit, um, and uh, you know, where the shadow is, that's Windsor. So uh, it's, uh, you know, and when you um, get off the 401 and you drive into Windsor, you see those tall towers on the right. Yes, on the right there. So those are the GM towers. They're called the Renaissance, um, the Renaissance Center, um, which is in Detroit. But you see that when you get off uh, the 401 and you enter, uh, get on Dougal, uh, and you enter Windsor, and if you and you feel like you're driving towards these towers until you get to the river and you realize you can't get there <laughs> because it's actually a different country. Um, so um, the the idea of being on the border is very much a lived experience, and for many, it's an experience uh, that is very painful and violent uh, because they can't they can't cross. You know, there is a bridge and there are tunnels and there have been multiple tunnels over generations. Um, but, and, 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 and in the different times, uh, you know, uh, they have been um, hard to cross. The most recent uh, crossings, of course, uh, the most recent complexities in the crossing uh, has been uh, since 2001, uh, since 9-11, uh, when uh, all folks crossing the border need a passport, uh, um, which has uh, dramatically limited um, the amount of people uh, who do cross. So um, very quickly, because I don't, I, you know, um, don't want to make this a, um, um, a go through it in a lot of detail. So, uh, so the idea behind Border Cultures was uh, that rather than having one sort of comprehensive exhibition of what it means to be uh, a border city, um, for it to be a bit of a research platform. Um, so ways in which the ideas and the questions we were asking could evolve through artist practices. And so it could be a platform where artists could actually test out different um, um, ideas or propositions of what a border is, or what a border can be, and how it can be reimagined, how it can be redesigned, sh shall we say. So um, part one uh, was what a, uh, uh, Border Cultures Part 1, uh, we looked at the themes of homes and land, um, and which was in 2013. And Part 2, that we, which you see, is uh, looked at the themes of work and labor, um, uh, which was in 2014. These were all group exhibitions. And then Part 3 um, looked at the themes of security and surveillance. And I thought I would just quickly focus on this, because uh, this uh, one, uh, perhaps a little more than the others, uh, speaks to, uh, you know, the questions of inclusivity that we're talking about. Um, so while, um, as we can go to the next slide, um, um, I don't know if, should I go, I don't know how much time I have uh, yet. Uh, um, so while we were looking at, uh, you know, these national boundaries as they stand today, it was really important for me to also think about how borders or the armature of the border is dispersed, um, uh, you know, within uh, within our cities, within our um, 
you know, within our everyday, uh, the, perhaps the barriers that are um, are invisible um, uh, that that do segregate communities. So this is a work by Camille Turner and Kamal Pirbai. Um, it was sort of the uh, beginning of a series uh, that they've uh, that they started working on called Wanted. Um, and uh, in this uh, in this series, uh, they're actually looking at uh, ads of runaway runaway slaves. Um, and these were um, enslaved peoples in Canada, uh, not the folks, uh, because the you know the narrative, the dominant narrative of slavery in Canada is um, that you know folks came from the states and became free in Canada through the Underground Railroad, which is also very much uh, an important narrative in Windsor and Detroit because the Underground Railroad is takes place. I mean, is um, uh, is there, um, and some of the first safe houses were built there. But we hear very little about the, um, you know, the um, uh, the enslaved peoples uh, who were the f one of the earliest black settlers in Canada, um, who have a very different story. Um, so what they do is they uh, they embody um, uh, these ads through these um, in a in a very playful way, looking at sort of uh, fashion um, fashion fashion magazines. So if you read. Um, you know, up top it says a uh, blue jersey jacket and petticoat, dark cotton cap uh, with a yellow string and an Indian um, shawl around the neck. So basically, this is the description of the runaway of the runaway slave. So they embody that in this uh, um, uh, in um, you know in these ads. So rather than um, you know, imagining, or viewing them as sort of, um, or representing them as victims, rather thinking about this, their spirit of survival, because even though the stakes were so high by them running away, uh, many of the many of the folks, uh, you know, would would try to do that over and over again. So, um, um, so you know, the, the, um, trying to um, um, take back their freedom. So the next slide. Um, is the work um, by Rebecca, sorry. The next slide is the work by, maybe I'll do the same as you. Oh, thank you. The next slide is the work by Rebecca Belmore, um, which for me is uh, was uh, one of the starting points uh, for this exhibition. Um, and this is a work by, called uh, The Named and the Unnamed, uh, which is based on a, a performance that she did uh, in Vancouver's uh, downtown east side um, in commemoration uh, of, uh, at the time when she did uh, the 50 um, um, missing Aboriginal women. Um, and you know uh, that when she had done this performance uh, and the installation, I believe uh, the case hadn't been you know hadn't been solved and uh, uh, frankly wasn't actually taken seriously. Um, so uh, this notion of security and surveillance uh, really brings up questions of uh, citizenship and how safe we feel on a very fundamental basis and who is the security and surveillance for who is being surveyed you know uh, whether they're it's the black men and women or um, or Aboriginal women um, um, and and so once again tying in questions of uh, who is a citizen and how do we um, understand that so in this performance uh, this is a an installation uh, that uh, that is uh, that documents her performance um, and uh, the way in which it's shown is that it's on a, a sort of a large uh, um, screen um, where, uh, where there are bulbs um, on the screen on which the video is projected um, so in in the performance uh, and I won't get into it we can definitely talk about it in more detail at the Q&A if anyone uh, would like, is that, um, you know, she reads out the names of all the missing uh, and um, um, she, she doesn't read out, she uh, yells out their names and sort of calling them um, and uh, um, their presence into, um, uh, into a physical space from which they were disappeared. Um, and so thereby marking their presence um, and their contributions to the land. Yeah, I'll just speak about this one and then we can um, leave the rest. And then this is another uh, really important work um, for this, uh, for the exhibition. It's called The Index of the Disappeared. Um, and it was, uh, it's an, inst it's a, um, it's an archive actually 
um, by um, an artist duo, Mariam Khani and Chitra Ganesh, uh, who are from New York. Um, and they started this archive after 9-11 um, uh, uh, in New York uh, with the sort of uh, rapid pace at, at which people were being uh, deported and, um, uh, you know, um, imprisoned. Um, and, uh, you know, of course, with the, in, uh, and the kind of the, and, um, disappeared at Guantanamo and the, and the lack of resources that they had. So, um, so the installation, uh, I mean, the archive is composed of multiple, um, so it's an ongoing archive. So they started it trying to sort of record all the people who are being, uh, you know, all the deportations, all the, um, all the people who are being disappeared, um, working very closely with uh, uh, legal, um, legal, uh, legal uh, activists. Um, and as uh, materials were being uh, were declassified. They would continue adding it to the uh, to the to the archive. Um, so, um, if we could just go to the next slide for a second. Um, so this is it's it's a room where. Um, so this is a. Um, you know the the computer the projection it's a it's an online project as well um and so they're playing off of the aesthetic of uh, you know the library cards and you can um click on any one of them and you know uh, get a you know uh, each folder will open up uh, into um uh, numerous um uh you know uh, files basically um on Guantanamo or the others and then the, there are drawings which was the previous um uh, slide uh, by Chitra Ganesh, which uh, and the and the drawings are uh, based on the uh, imagery, uh, the news, the media, the media based imagery of um, you know folks who were in Guantanamo um, uh, and uh, and of course Homeland Security. So I'll leave it there. Um, thank you. So last but not least. Um, Alain Pescador. Um, he's a participant that um, I've invited because you know I was really thinking about how how do we broaden the conversation? How do we make sure that the conversations we have in the art world among artists and and arts professionals don't stay just in this bubble? Uh, do they have an impact outside? And Alain is involved with this amazing conference, Six Degrees. He's the director of, of this new project. Um, working at uh, the ICC, the Institute for Canadian Citizenship, and he can tell us a little bit about how these connections can be made and impact can be made. That's awesome. Um, should we play the video first? Yeah. Great. Person to be giving the 14th La Fontaine Golden Lecture. The only time. The future is radical. Um, we just have to choose which form of radical we want.
Because of his wisdom, practicality, and his total commitment to the betterment of the world through a realistic understanding of the way in which democracy can bring citizens to their fullest level of participation, it is my great pleasure to honor His Highness, the Aga Khan, with his first Global Citizenship Prize. Equalitarianism should ask us to respect our differences, but not to ignore them, to integrate diversity, not to depreciate diversity. non-artist here in the panel, I thought I should first uh, help frame the kind of work that I do uh, for the Institute for Canadian Citizens through a video that uh, we recently just uh, are in the midst of finalizing, but I thought I should give you a sneak preview of uh, what happened in this three-day uh, event focused on inclusion and citizenship and how those two issues look like in the 21st century. And uh, also, before continuing, I wanted to thank Mona and Jessica and everyone at the uh, Coughlin Center for the Arts uh, for inviting us and for putting on this uh, fantastic panel, and to, to everyone here for, for all of your ideas and discussions. As, again, the non-artist, I'll explain a bit of the project uh, that, I've, that I've done and also uh, help um, explain how the arts and uh, the cultural dimension has been instrumental in the work we do. Uh, we absolutely believe that through the use of um, the means of arts and culture, we can create uh, social change. Uh, I think um, words are very important. Um, intellectual capacity is very important. But I think that the uh, arts are, um, are a mean that can help us really understand uh, some of the most uh, pressing issues of our times. And so we believe that arts and culture gives us that imagination that is required for us to be able to decipher those solutions uh, that are most uh, in most need uh, in these days. And um, I mean, imagination, it's, it's all a matter of uh, think, thinking circular or more in a more spatial way as opposed to, you know, the, the traditional way that we do things uh, in the West and, and, and in uh, many of the colonial societies, which is very uh, linear thinking. And so the arts and culture provides us that space to be uh, imaginative and to think through issues differently. A bit like our indigenous people do with uh, the traditions of uh, singing, of dancing, of drumming. I mean, after all, the drum is... Uh, the, the heart of, of, of Mother Earth. And so I think that in the context of Canada, we should always be mindful of that uh, to understand how to look into the future when it comes to inclusion and citizenship, we should look through our imagination. And uh, here in Canada, Indigenous peoples have uh, a very important tool through arts and culture that are uh, allowing us to imagine how to move forward into building more inclusive societies. Now, just very briefly, I'm going to run you through how arts and culture has impacted uh, some of the work that we've been doing uh, around Six Degrees. Um, if we go to the next slide. Uh, there's been two themes, two central themes that we've launched on the inaugural edition of Six Degrees, which took place from the uh, 19th to the 21st of September. Um, one of them, uh, which I'll, I'll, I'll mention in a bit, but first, uh, to this photo to give frame to that central theme. This uh, is a photography by uh, photographer Ian Wilms. Uh, he's a freelancer here out of Toronto. Uh, this is um, one of her uh, subjects. 
She, uh, her name is Idil Hassan. She's 34 years old, uh, immigrated here um, at about uh, age 15. Uh, now has uh, a little daughter that's six years old uh, from Somalia originally. And this photo, what we're looking at is uh, the Regent Park Aquatic Center. This beautiful space. Uh, if you haven't been, I recommend you go to, to it. Uh, it's made out of glass and wood. It's just fantastic architecture. And what she's doing is she's looking at her daughter uh, swimming in that pool. Because all Saturdays, uh, they actually taint the glasses that surround the pool and allow for um, Muslim uh, communities, especially women, uh, to swim, swim and relax and just enjoy themselves. Um, as you know, and we, we've talked to her, uh, and as you know, um, in the tradition of um, Muslim uh, uh, communities, they, um, women are not allowed uh, to be seen uh, with a few clothes by men. And so just to, after a conversation we had with her, she just said, you know, I wouldn't come before to this pool because my religion doesn't allow women to be seen uncovered by men. Uh, it's really helpful to have that day to ourselves. I even learned to swim. So um, this photograph actually led us to, if you wouldn't mind going to the next slide, uh, to that notion of inclusion. And as Mona was saying, how do we build more inclusive societies? And that has been central to the work and the discussions that we've had around Six Degrees. And, you know, constantly we're listening to people saying and referring to Toronto as the most multicultural city around the world, and as Canada as one that's leading and at the cutting edge of diversity uh, when it comes to, you know, issues of diversity. And uh, there's just one thing. Yes, we're very inclusive. As you can see from that photo, there's been a lot of things that have been put forward uh, to include uh, communities better into the social fabric of Canada. However, I still don't believe, and that's an issue that we could explore a bit more uh, in length in a bit, I still don't believe we know how to express this or that we have the right language to really tell people why inclusion in some instances works here in Canada. And so that's part of the discussions that we wanted to have at Six Degrees and that we continue to have because we still don't have an answer to that. If we go to the next, which um, this, this next theme um, is quite you know, self-evident. There's people in the move. Um, there's refugees coming out of the boat. I was privileged enough to have spent two weeks um, in the islands uh, in Greece, in Lesbos in particular, welcoming uh, refugees as they were coming off dingy boats. This boat actually seems a lot more civilized than the boats that refugees are coming through. I'm sure you've seen those rubber boats uh, that have just, you know, it's, it's, it's amazing the kind of conditions that they, that they uh, sort of, um, you know, these refugees are, are, are forced uh, to undertake. And so uh, certainly this issue of people in the move was part of the conversation um, on six degrees. And this pho photograph was taken by Daniel Eder, a uh, pretty uh, young but prominent photographer in Germany. And it was through this photograph that uh, it inspired us to take on the theme of uh, Exodus. Um, and there you see a partner with her brand. Um, and uh, through this, um, this, this, this photo, um, it helped us to reimagine how we can build communities and structures for a society that are able to cope with uh, mass migration and the movement of people. There's this inevitability about the movement of people. I think Jimena mentioned how it's just part of her history. People move. And now as we look into um, you know, the effects of climate change and as we continue to see the growth in uh, social political strife around the world, I think the movement of people will continue. And we need to ensure that we uh, first are able to discuss some solutions that we can provide to the crisis, uh, but also that we're able to take on those discussions into real actions to build uh, communities that are able to, hope, to cope with, uh, with, the, with the movement of people. And just the last slide, um, if you remind Mona, uh, this has um, become our hero image. Um, 
and once you see it sort of uh, it's, it's the boat here it's, it's a bit more compressed uh, because of the um, presentation but it's a long boat uh, it is two floors in the boat there you probably only see around 150 um, refugees there's actually 500 refugees so on the bottom of that boat there's uh, around 300 of them and uh, this become what in the structuring of six degrees we've called our hero image we were looking for that photo that inspired the work that we were about to do it was the inaugural edition of six degrees and so we really needed some uh, visual elements uh, and in this case uh, some photography to really help us define uh, some of the clear structures of it. And just as we're here with um, amazing artists, I thought that I would leave this picture up there and uh, also just read something else that comes from the arts, the world of the arts that also inspires some of our work. Um, it's a two minute poem and then we can leave it there. I'm sure there's a lot of uh, stuff that we need to uh, talk about. Uh, but uh, this has definitely become uh, instrumental uh, around our office and particularly is, is, um, it's, it's resonating a lot with uh, what, I've, what I've built. Um, and this is a poem by um, a British poet. Her name is Warson Shire. She uh, was actually born in Kenya but moved to uh, Britain from Somali parents. And this is called uh, Home by Warson Shire. No one leaves home unless home is the mouth of a shark. You only run for the border when you see the whole city running as well. Your neighbors running faster than you. The boy you went to school with who kissed you dizzy behind the old tin factory is holding a gun bigger than his body. You only leave home when home won't let you stay. No one will leave home unless Home chased you, fire on their feet, hot bloody in your belly. It's not something you ever thought about doing. And so when you did, you carried the anthem under your breath, waiting until the airport toilet to tear off the passport and swallow. Each mouthful of paper making it clear that you wouldn't be going back. You have to understand, no one puts their children in a boat unless the water is safer than the land who would choose to spend days and nights in the stomach of a truck unless the miles traveled meant something more than journey. No one would choose to crawl under fences, be beaten until your shadow leaves you, raped, then drowned, forced to the bottom of the boat because you are darker. Be sold, starved, shot at the border like a sick animal. Be pitied, lose your name, lose your family. Make a refugee camp at home for a year or two, or ten. Stripped and search, find person everywhere. And if you survive, and you're greeted on the other side with go home blacks, refugees, dirty immigrants, asylum seekers circling a country dry of milk. Look what they've done to their own countries while it's due to Europe to ours. The dirty looks in the streets. Softer than a limb torn off, the indignity of everyday life. More tender than 14 men who look like your father between your legs, and salt's easier to swallow than rubble. Then your child's body in pieces. For now, forget about pride. Your survival is more important. I want to go home, but home is the mouth of a shark. Home is the barrel of the gun. And no one will leave home unless home chases you to the shore. Unless home tells you to leave what you could not behind, even if it was human. No one leaves home until home is a damn voice in your ear saying, leave, run now. I don't know what I've become. Thanks. So, <laughs> what does art have to offer in this conversation, in this change that we're talking about? Um, I will ask you this question and I'll offer some thoughts too, I think, you know, in, in, 
in a very basic philosophical experiential way art is in its essence other it confronts us with something new and different that wasn't there in the world before um, especially in the visual arts i think those of us who work in art galleries um, have this experience of sometimes visitors coming in and and asking where is the art uh, not because there's nothing in the gallery, but because what they see doesn't conform to their idea of what art should be. So even on that very level, you know, this question of otherness is posed and it's asking uh, people to change their views, to change their ideas, to, to be open. Um, but I wonder even more so with, with artwork that is created from a different cultural perspective that brings in a different you know, speaks about different traditions, like in your work, Surrender, or the work that Jimena was talking about, or that Shimoye is presenting at the gallery. Um, you know, even though it comes from an autobiographical perspectives and, and from, a culture, from cultural specificity, it's meant for this context, it's meant to be engaged with here. So can we convey meaning across cultural divides, and, and what does that do? Who wants to, to talk about that? Um, I think, first of all, we have to remember um, that uh, children um, are not educated to be visually literate. Everyone is taught to read, and when you are an adult, you can choose whether you want to read the Washington Post or the Toronto Sun. You, but you have the tools. And I think that one of the real difficulties with the visual arts is that um, people who read, uh, if their favorite author is Daniel Steele, um, they don't expect Daniel Steele to win the Nobel Prize for Literature. So I, I think what I'm trying to say is that um, um, that's why it's often very difficult for uh, people who aren't in the arts to actually have a sense of how the arts have changed since the idea that there's a, a painting with a literal subject. So, I mean, that's, I think there's a big barrier right there from the very beginning. Um, we don't have the same respect as some other art forms because uh, people, you know, they, they do want often mediocrity because that's what they used to. And, and that's not really answering your question, but I guess I'm trying to... There, there's always, there's also, there can be a perception that, you know, this work is not meant for me, whoever mm -hmm. me is. It's meant for an audience that knows that context that it's coming from. But I think, you know, especially from the perspective of, of an immigrant who's asked to learn about the country where he or she lands, you know, to learn about Canada, for instance, to pass a citizenship test, to, to know these things. It's equally important to know each other's stories, to find out about everyone else. I guess my, um, um, because you ended saying, uh, what does it make, mean to make the work here? And I guess my question would be, where is here? You know, is here, is there, here and there? I just can't remember the name of the author and perhaps someone can uh, help me uh, the book here, there, and elsewhere. Um, she teaches in Berkeley, feminist. <laughs> um, 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 anyway, uh, anyway, and so she writes a lot uh, about um, you know the perspectives of um, uh, migration, uh, migrants and refugees, but really questioning uh, where is here, you know, um, and here is yes. The here and now, the very local and specific, uh, but also I think that we, um, I don't, in my experience, and yes, of course, you know, we do have those experiences of, you know, where, what is, where is the art, but at the same time, I think that the audience and, and folks public is actually looking for intelligent, um, is looking for a conversation. And I think that one of the, you know, the, the power of the agency that art and artists have is to engage in that conversation in ways that can be extremely disarming, 
you know, that uh, perhaps they will not read in the Washington Post or New York Times or whatever. Um, but, um, but when they're confronted with it, um, or um, they, they encounter it rather, um, it can have um, um, an emotional response uh, that perhaps makes them feel in makes one feel things that one would not or you know we would not uh, we not be inclined to read or, or or to you know to deliberately go out and go and seek out um, and I think that is uh, where the strength of the arts comes in is that it can integrate um, all uh, these experiences uh, whether it is um, from from uh, um, through different from different perspectives uh, through you know through the work um, so that, that would be my... Thank you. Um, hi yeah I think I think it must right like convey content right like it must it must move through because um, otherwise what are, what is it doing um, I there's a couple of things that are interesting to me and I think that there's there's the way that I see there's two clumps right like Maybe there shouldn't be, but so there's the people that are here and their art and their relationship to their art and their art history that they're being taught and um, and and uh, their ability to also seek out the art and how they choose to relate to that um, in, in the way that they're brought up in their schools um, in what they are being taught. And then there are immigrants. Um, and so in a lot of cases, what is already like the relationship that they're coming to art that they're bringing? from before they were here and then after that in the process of assimilating into a new country and finding a job and in integrating into a school where is the space to seek out that art in order to create that relationship to what it is that that you're looking to see back like to are you find are you looking for that mirror and what why is it that you're looking at it um so when you think about these audiences um and you think about the integration of both of those things right like for me this drive is work ideally that can speak to both to that can be looked at for both from both of those sides and can be read um but often it is my experience that it isn't is that it, it that we are catering our art to our audiences like for a specific glare um and so the question then goes okay so when i think about my mom and i think about shows here in theater which is the only thing that i can really speak to uh, often i go to shows and i think my mom would have dropped like I almost like I caught maybe 97 95 percent of the text that's being thrown at me and my English is great um but while watching a show and and being married to the language of it to the text based of it it drops and so when I think about my mom whose English is let's say 20 percent 30 percent not as good as mine um I wonder okay where did how where does this stop talking talking to her because of the barrier so where is this work it isn't thinking about her. And then the question is, does it need to be thinking about her, right? Um, and then, then there's the, the flip side of that, which is the work that I want to do, and this is a big, big question in theater and in diverse theater, um, do I have to speak to my migrant experience in all of the work that I do? Am I speaking to like the Latino community, the Latinx community in the work that I do? Because it is read often that way. Oh, it's a play by a Latino company that is touching on Latino subjects, so why would I, born and raised in Canada, like, it's not for me, I'm not going to get it, it's not, like, speaking to me. Um, where, and so I wonder about, like, for me, and I'm just, again, learning this scene, because I've only been in Toronto for three years, and so where those boundaries are being pushed, and where they exist, and what it is that our audience is, um, what is the conversation? that we're, Are we actually asking to have a conversation with our audience? Are they used to being asked? To be a part of the conversation or are they have they learned to just sit and read the things that they're like accustomed to reading um that's where i think the 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 questions are for me like the it isn't about the content the content is there like we artists canadian or migrant like have things to say we have questions to ask um and it'll move through it's just about where, where what is it moving over and and where are we delineating those things that i think that it lays for me yeah I think in theater, especially, you know, there, there's a risk of losing, you know, the, some of its very essence that it, you know, it functions as this 
art form that happens live, so it's potentially dangerous, right? I mean, I, I don't know if everybody's read this article, which has happened with the Hamilton performance yeah. and the certain vice president. Um, yeah. But this is where art is at its best, where it creates situations that respond to the very moment and you have a collective of people who are present in the moment and who react and and you know voice something very important yes it's, it's art, art becoming language like and it always has been right a language of its own but it's it's about using it right and, and actually like to making it a tool and also about creating that space mm -hmm. that is not a safe space in hmm. that sense of no challenging ideas or no questioning happening. Um, and you talked you talk a little bit about um, this notion of the space that theater can create. Yeah, I mean, and I think it's interesting to think about safe space. Um, someone once told me that there are no, there is no such thing as a safe space. It's written somewhere. And it's, it was taught to me through Pastor Minnie Mouse, but we can only ever hope to really create safer spaces. Um, in this space right here, and just in, in between the five of us and, and between the rest of us, there are some of my truths that are dangerous and harmful to, to some of yours, um, inherently. Um, and so there isn't, like, there's no real way of creating a space where we are all actually safe. And so when we talk about integration, when we talk about diversity, when we talk about all those things, often safeness is such an important part of it. Um, and yet, especially in art, you're constantly reminded never to play it safe. So um, if you're safe, if you're not scared, you're not, you're not at the work yet. You're not at the heart of the thing yet because it's about your truth, which is covered under layers and layers and layers of protection. And, and it's dangerous to go there because it is. And so work that, just the idea that someone, I mean, it's just, I don't want to talk about it because it's just, it seems per superfluous to, for me that, that, I mean, and, uh, yeah, this is how I get very frustrated about the elections. Um, we all are. um, it's just, you can't, you can't look at art and say, this needs to be a safe space. Um, because that's not its job. And certainly it isn't Hamilton. I don't know. I've never seen it and I haven't heard it all, but my understanding of it is that it completely challenges all of the standards racially and culturally of the American history. So inherently, like, it's dangerous what they're doing um, by by fault of doing it. And and they are taking on that risk. And so for someone that is an actual player in the scale that they are to... Um, <sighs> the danger is that they're, it's, a, it's an immediate silencing of the artist. It's an immediate saying of not being able to cope with art uh, doing in a tiny, tiny way what hopefully artists will start lashing out in like boulders that way, which is to ask those questions, to name those truths. Um, yeah, that's where I'm, I am. I don't, I don't know if it's how worth it, it is to give him and that event um, power, other than to say that I am very proud to be a part of a community of theater artists that um, see themselves past the bullshit. <laughs> that is being thrown. Yeah, I guess it depends on what kind, which space we're talking about uh, too, right? So um, for and me, what safe means. Yeah, and what safe means in that specific context too. Um, for me, uh, working in the context of a public gallery, it's really important for me that the gallery space uh, is, uh, is a respectful space, a space where we can engage in meaningful conversations. And that, in, and that lies at the core of my, my curatorial practice, my approach, where um, uh, the notion is always to, uh, to find ways of uh, developing um, conversations, dialogues, uh, whether it is through artworks or through artists, um, and, as well as um, the communities, the viewers, uh, the folks, you know, all of us working in the galleries, uh, rather than it being, um, uh, you know, silos, right? Like the artist and the audience and the artwork and the, <laughs> the staff, because actually we're all players. We're all building the culture together. Um, so, um, so I think that, I think that there is, for me, I think we need to, 
um, think about what is safe, um, you know, what it means to create a safe space or an inclusive space where um, we can have um, discussions through, um, you know, whether it's, and I, you know, I guess I'll speak uh, more um, to um, the visual art context within a public uh, gallery or a public museum. How are we engaging with collections? Um, how, um, and, you know, understanding who obviously the community is um, and the different ways in which we can, um, th that, the, the, that the community is a part of the gallery because it is, ultimately it is a public space. And rather than having, you know, tokenistic engagements where we do one-off <laughs> uh, shows or programs that how can they become integrated within the fabric of, of the program. Um, so, and, and, and in that respect for me, uh, I think it, it is, you know, that's a safe, that's a safe space where it does not mean that we can't have difficult dialogues and it does not mean that we can't have dialogues where we disagree with one another. Um, but I think it becomes a space where those things can manifest, you know, the difference, uh, the differences and the diversities, um, yeah, the differences can, um, can be extremely rich, right? Um, um, and violent and need not be oppositional um, um, because there is too much of that, you know, in the world and we just need to um, move, yeah, I think it's important to move past that sort of oppositional thinking, uh, rather to think about ways in which we can have constructive conversation um, um, that can maybe, hopefully, lead, lead us to, um, um, a space of mutual respect. One of the ways in which art can offer, I think, a model for you know, getting past this oppositional model um, is something that um, this Israeli author, David Grossman, um, talks about. Um, he's a really important voice for peace, and he um, offers the model of the author, of the writer, and we don't have any writers <laughs> here with us to discuss this, but I found it very interesting because he talks about the the radical other, otherness that the writer has to embody, has to understand in mm -hmm. order to give voice to the many different characters that they create mm -hmm. and really imagining oneself in the other's place, in the other's life experience, um, the worldview, it's so crucial and if, you know, if this would be a lesson that, that can be taught to society at large, would be so beneficial. Um, so I don't know if you if you see this happening or possible in your various disciplines of work. Um, I just wanted to bring up um, the uh, uh, the map museum pass, which uh, I don't know if mm -hmm. m most of you are aware, but if you're a um, a member of the Toronto Public Library you can get passes for two adults and four children to go to museums like the Aga Khan, the Textile Museum, the Rom. And if you can imagine uh, an immigrant family with four or five children, two adults, it would cost them like a hundred dollars mm -hmm. to get into, um, into the museum. And I know that it's really changed the face of the audience of the Textile Museum which, you know, every time I go, it's usually, you know, knitters and, you know, I mean, uh, sorry, that's not disrespectful at all. I'm just trying to explain that all of a sudden there's a new audience. Um, and often I know in my culture, going to a museum or an art gallery is just not a thing they do. Even when, for example, the little girl in my film. I've shown that film a number of times in Ontario, and each time I tell her parents, you know, it would be really nice for her to see herself on the screen. They have never gone. So, you know, it's, uh, so I'm really happy about the map because it brings people into the galleries who might normally um, be looking for a different kind of art. Maybe I'll, I'll interject here because there's uh, some commonalities with the work that uh, I do 
around uh, inclusion and citizenship, especially for the Institute for Community Citizenship. We have uh, a similar program, uh, which is called the Cultural Access Class. Mm -hmm. That gives access to uh, new citizens as soon as they swear their oath to close to uh, 150 uh, cultural institutions around the country. Uh, and uh, we've seen that new citizens are able to relate strongly to the society, the Canadian society, the social fabric here in our communities through art. It's very important for them to go to the realm. It is very important for them to access uh, these cultural institutions. They've learned a great, great deal. So exposing and giving opportunities to communities, to art spaces where they can learn, where they can open their imagination, I think it's, it's very, very important. Uh, the other thing that we've started doing is with the new wave of the 25,000 uh, Syrian refugees, we've also given them the opportunity uh, as the same new citizens get to access these institutions. Uh, there's something quite unique about Canada. And as I mentioned during my brief uh, introduction, it's very, very hard to explain what it is. And I think arts and culture is able to, to do that. Um, Canada doesn't necessarily, from what I've seen, and please correct me if I'm wrong, doesn't necessarily have a myth of conception where there's, you know, a Robin Hood or uh, in the case of me being Mexican, you know, that uh, symbol of uh, an eagle sitting on a cactus uh, eating a snake where everyone that's in Mexico could relate to it, and, you know, sing to it and feel proud about it. Uh, here in Canada, I don't think there's uh, that myth of, of conception that we can relate to. And so I think that the arts and culture, it's a good way, especially for uh, new uh, citizens and for immigrants to get to learn a bit more about Canadian history and a bit more about where uh, we stand. So that's just, uh, I think what I, what I wanted to offer, but that also goes back to the importance of art and culture in, in our everyday life. And also I think it goes back to something that we all felt really important to acknowledge that um, there is a much longer history before Canadian history. Mm -hmm. um, and that as immigrants, we, you know, as, as a new kind of immigrants, <laughs> that, you know, we still have to come to terms with us being here and also settling here um, and examining the colonial history and acknowledging the indigenous histories. And so I, you know, I thought it was really interesting the perspectives that you all had on, on this responsibility as newcomers. Well, I think that what's great about, it's so great to, I didn't know about that program and I just, I'm waiting to get called to get sworn in because I passed my citizenship exam like a month ago. Um, so that's great. <laughs> uh, but I think what's interesting about that and it's great to hear it, um, because it's so hard to really, like it's a, it takes a lot of work, like it takes a lot of infrastructure also to actually get these newcomers into the rooms and into the art. Um, and so these programs are so really, really so key and to hear that, you know, you do see yourself, it, it is a huge help to, to learn Canada's culture through art. And I can only imagine that it's probably because when you look at Canada's culture as far back as Canada, it's been a country, there has been newcomers, right? And, and that they have been a pivotal part. They, there's a stamp of, a, of an immigrant community in every part of our history. Um, and so just to find yourself as a parallel to you in the history of the country that you're new to is, um, is so important, it's so precious. Um, and I think when, and, and to take that even further back, right? And, and more and more, and it is so important and I'm so happy. I was just um, Native Earth, which is um, the indigenous, uh, one of the most permanent oldest indigenous theater companies in in the country. They just they have their Wasaga Check Begins to Dance Festival, and I was just at a briefing session about the new granting system uh, that the Canada um, uh, Arts Council is setting up, and they're do they're doing a huge, huge, huge investment in their in our first peoples, particularly. And it was so wonderful to see that they are clearing as many blockages for our our first people to really make art, to really start communicating to us, to the rest of us, 
about her history and and about their new their new works and i think that married to the waves and waves of new of newcomers that are that are still and will continue to come is key and i think i mentioned this um on a brief conversation before like the way that i see it is is um because our prominent culture is also a migrant culture so the anglo culture in canada is also a newcomer culture to canada um and even though we stand on it as the norm it isn't and it's it's as if the anglo sized in francophone culture is the middle of a coin and 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 to look at it from um from our indigenous peoples is to look at it from one side of being migrated into and and then assimilated over and then the rest of us would come to assimilate into that thing that assimilated over um our first people and so how we navigate that relationship as it becomes clearer and clearer as the veil keeps getting lifted and hopefully the work emerges that keeps asking these questions and to and to really look at that work as it as it recovers from the generational genocide that we've been through so they've lost a clump in the in the way that they've passed they, they they will pass down their information and it's a big big issue and it's a big part of the granting process that is coming um i was so happy to hear that they have mentoring grants coming for for emerging artists to find that 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 way of of, of reconnecting with language and with their elders um as they figure that out and that work comes up we need to be looking very closely as immigrants and as canadians um because that is there is a there is a culture that when when we came it became inclusive it it allowed before it was taken um and 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 their traditions their circular traditions their traditions in drumming their traditions in communicating through through uh physical tales and through oral traditions um past language that that transcend our blockages as others as other peoples are key i believe in in the art that that we need to make um and so and i think that is also it, it goes back to this 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 notion of of, because, of being a writer and like how far out of yourself you have to take yourself to write it is also how far into yourself you have to go right like how much uh do you exist in the history that already exists not by not not by claiming it or by by um what is the word that i'm looking for appropriating english um not by appropriating it but by finding by doing what art looks to do right by looking at it and looking at the spaces that it allows for you to see yourself in it um so i do believe though that that is at the core of the work that's ahead yeah well i think it's you know um uh, it's empathy right um in 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 that quote uh while the writer goes deep inside or outside their bodies to find that other voice there is a whole there are the readers who do the same thing to 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 um you know make the process complete right so um so i, I think it's a circle and um and 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 that's what i mean in terms of thinking about um you know not thinking about it oppositionally and uh, artists versus audience and you know i think that uh i think that um i think as uh, personally as um you know as someone who has moved here and lived here and for so many years i have to reckon with uh my um you know sort of my role as a settler in in canada and what does that mean in the work that i do um and how and so how can i learn um and unlearn uh, the various um assumptions uh that uh, that come into play um as as a settler um and i think and i think it's a it's a it's a personal process or a process as well as uh, something that can only be done um in dialogue uh with um and, you know um yeah in dialogue rather than um a solo you know uh, for me a, a solo process um but it, and um yeah that's all um i just wanted to pick up on one thing that uh, shrimoy said it was the word empathy mm -hmm. um a really successful work of art and i'm thinking of the rebecca belmore piece mm -hmm. does bring in all kinds of people who normally would not go into a gallery to see a video um so you know it was filmed in the back alleys of vancouver which 
um, they're very specific. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, it was also the point where um, when she names these women, she has some roses mm -hmm. and she rips the, the rose across her mouth and you know it's got thorns. Mm -hmm. And so um, one of the reasons that piece is so powerful is it has a, a visceral pain um, that comes through. And I think it, it brought in a lot of people mm -hmm. that normally wouldn't um, have seen the work. Thank you. So we're getting close to the end of our um, program here. Uh, but I wanted to see if anyone in the audience had any questions before we conclude. Yes. Um, there's a theme that I've been hearing in the different presentations, and I'm just going to try to articulate it a little bit. Um, you know, I keep thinking about the Canada Council, for example. So when, when I read the announcement, and they talked about the, I don't remember what it's called, the new something program. Or it's basically the, the 150th anniversary of Canada. And one interesting thing that popped out in the description was that it said that it's to acknowledge, and then in brackets, but not celebrate the anniversary of this country. And I was like, that I cannot imagine being normal. <laughs> you know, that, a, that a, a national granting agency with a program uh, to mark the anniversary of the nation state saying we have a program to acknowledge, but not celebrate the nation state. Like that, that was an interesting thing that I've never seen before. Uh, and then I'm reminded from more like when you mentioned about uh, not getting citizenship and you know is identifying as Canadian or Indian or identifying with the nation state how relevant or what that means to you or to us. Uh, and then remembering the video that I lent, that you mentioned, um, th th that you showed, uh, at one point there's a musician who's wearing a jacket that says, Hallucination. And so I just, I guess I want to pose it as a question, like if we're thinking about inclusion, citizenship, the nation state, etc., does the word hallucination resonate in any way with what you guys are thinking about? Hallucination? Hallucination. I think you probably speak to that, but I think you're you're uh, you're making a very good point. Um, and your name is Luis. Yeah. Is right? uh, you're making a very good point. I think that what we're seeing here is that Canada is at a point where it's no longer functioning as a nation state, and so we see it in that granting mechanism, and constantly we're 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 hearing, and even from our prime minister saying that perhaps Canada is at a post nationalistic state where people are coming from all over where yes of course there's borders that surround us and there's one really big border border hopefully not a wall soon um, dividing us but um, all of our communities and all of the different perspectives makes us a very 21st century nation which is uh, completely being forgotten around the world that you know, there's diversity everywhere. It's just that what still matters to make some change is to really create inclusive societies. And that's really what we should be striving for. But I think, I mean, in a way I agree with, I'm not sure whether uh, your statement was as a, as a mean of disagreement with the way um, uh, that granting agency was, was uh, framing their uh, opportunity. I don't think it was. I think it was just an observation. But I think that, yes, I mean, since we're at a post-nationalistic stage, we perhaps shouldn't be binding ourselves to um, a celebration of a country that now is completely different than the way it used to be 150 years ago. Well, and I think, it, having heard um, that, yeah, um, kind of briefing on, on the new granting system, particularly in an Indigenous festival and speaking particularly about the Indigenous program, um, I think it's it, it seems clear to me that I think the, the offer is that, I want to be very careful about how I articulate this, um, 
we can't celebrate it while in an effort to amend to our first people. So you can't make this gesture to them and then call it a celebration of the thing that like required you to have to make this gesture 150 years later. So and I think that it's it is baffling. Baffling I think is is the is like spot on. It's just but it's uh, encouraging. And I think that to to hear a granting body claim that and say uh, it, this is not what we're doing. So to have them also be proactive about um, not only saying only um, to acknowledge and then not, not mention the celebration, but to go a step further and to say, this isn't about a celebration. We won't let it be about a celebration. Seems like a, a very generous, not only, it means that they're putting their mouth where their money is as well. So they're, they're making the gesture with their granting body and they're also saying, the, this is the ideology behind it. Um, the Hallucination is a Tribe Called Red's latest album and uh, I think their work speaks to what that is. And I think uh, I, it, is, it is that kind of work that I'm referring to when I say we have to look closely at how they are hashing it up. Like how they are, like how that particular um, group is um, breaching their own barriers and using their art to to become um, prominent and to speak and to and to and to to become skillful and and it's about it's about everything, right? And it's about being young and it's about partying and it's about um, their culture and they're plowing through slowly and they're coming up, you know, steadily um, with. A grip so tight on the core of what they are, um, that is so so inspiring. And I don't know um, how much I. I'm trying to think like to the specific words that you said. Um, <laughs> I'm blanking. Um, yeah, I'm gonna leave it at that because I blanked. So. I think. Uh, I mean, that's great. I didn't. I didn't know that. Um, and. By saying that, obviously, they, um, you know, it is the first step uh, into, you know, the process of reconciliation, maybe, and, you know, where every grant apply, yeah, everyone who applies for the grant must understand um, or try to understand or use it as a way to um, to begin to understand what reconciliation is uh, could be um, and how do we how do we begin that path? Um, I don't know uh, what post like post national and I don't I'm not sure um, if that's um, uh, yeah I'm not I'm not quite there yet <laughs> um, and uh, you know what that means or would mean uh, but I think that um, you know putting the questions of truth and reconciliation at the core um, of uh, the work that is emerging uh, will be I think uh, absolutely a game changer with uh, because it will shift all the paradigms um, and um, and will release a, a way of, um, you know, perhaps um, present new ways uh, uh, of thinking, looking, imagining, um, yeah, which is, which is very exciting. Um, and, you know, I think it'll be a um, time of, uh, like, shaking up a lot of things. Um, which are also it's not uh, which are also difficult so which we must acknowledge if you want to pass the mic behind you I think David had a question thank you wonderful panel and um, just reluctantly some years ago I went to Nuit Blanche and as I am standing in a uh, city hall um, hating being there and looking at this debauchery of festival, uh, my wife uh, points out that there is a homeless guy in awe staring at the performance. And she says, David, uh, don't be such a bitter old man. Uh, this guy probably has no access to art uh, as you do. You can walk into any museum, you can see any painting whenever you want. Don't take for granted that anybody has the same access or accessibility 
to these inspiring forces, no? And it, it really shook me there. I thought, wow, what would it be like not to be able to attend a concert when I want, or a play, or the importance that art plays in my role, in the role of my family, my circle, is irreplaceable, no? And yet, to think about accessibility and think not just about how newcomers have access to that, but there's a huge population around us that probably has zero virtual, no contact with artistic manifestations, no? So the question of how to begin opening those boundaries, those borders, I must say that uh, I was very impressed with the work that Mr. Pescador presented to us, but I was a bit put off by how corporate that video is. Uh, you know, it, it could have been uh, Mellon or the Carnegie Association uh, selling us bonds, you know, all these people with ties. Uh, sure, Adrian Clarkson is a very beloved figure, but I mean, she has come to represent somebody who travels in first class, who loves reading her books up there in those uh, cabins. And I think there's something about uh, opening the boundaries in languages, in visual languages, in forms of relating that uh, lower the defense of people. People are already very defensive about art and artistic practices let alone uh, questions of accessibility uh, amongst different socioeconomic groups, no? So, I, I mean, I don't need to be critical of the purposes of the organization, but uh, formally speaking, what would be the best ways of lowering those defensive systems? Well, I think this is uh, my opportunity to claim to to, to defend what I just uh, yeah. presented, so <laughs> thank you for that. Um, I strongly believe in the power of conversations and in the power of clear, creating platforms where people come together and have real discussions about things where they agree and about things where they disagree. Now, this three-minute video, uh, the designers, uh, which consider themselves artists, might hit you for the corporate assumption of things. Um, that's just how their art was represented. Uh, but uh, in fact, uh, you're right. I mean, uh, there's some corporate partners as well, some uh, public partners, and also some foundation partners that are behind the work of Six Degrees. But the point is not the kind of groups and stakeholders that we bring together. I think the point is, again, to provide that platform and that space where we can have real discussions. That um, reference to the hallucination, it's a, um, a, a quick shot of uh, something that we did uh, that was uh, very much with a purpose. One of the evenings at Six Degrees, we open it up for free to the public in general, to uh, the theme of uh, indigenous communities and to the theme of reconciliation. And so uh, along with the help of corporate partners, foundations, and the three levels of government, we decided to open up a platform that might seem corporate and that might seem a bit restrictive in terms of its, uh, of its reach but that actually the biggest event that we devoted around Six Degrees was a free open to the public event focused on what we believe is one of the most important central issues here in Canada, which is to find that reconciliation with our indigenous communities. And so I'm just mentioning this to say that one, we strongly believe in the power of conversations. Two, I think that there's uh, in anything we do, uh, some gifts and takes with the kind of relationships that we want to be uh, striking when it comes to creating a better good. In this case, at Six Degrees, we did partner with uh, corporates and uh, foundations in the public sector 
However, I think the greater good is what we uh, wanted to achieve, and I think we did a very good job of that. And lastly, um, at a core of any initiatives, and that's something that I believe as a director of the initiative, I think that that's the first thing that I um, that I've put in place, which is let's do this for the rest of us, not only just for a few of us. And uh, that representation of what we did that night when we opened up, um, you know, uh, an evening uh, for everyone, for the whole Toronto community to attend to on this issue of Indigenous communities, which I think is very important, is something that we should continue doing. Yeah. These platforms are very important and conversation must be had. So I think that your comments are very fair and uh, that's something that we should always keep in mind uh, in the work I do and the work that everyone does. And I certainly uh, take your, your feedback uh, in a very constructive way. And I, uh, as I have, I will continue to apply these notions that you've put forward on the table into the work that I do and that I continue doing. Thanks. So I think we should end on that note. <laughs> And um, if you are interested in continuing conversations, we welcome you back into the gallery and in uh, looking at the exhibition together. Um, Yonder is here only uh, for one more week, so if, if you haven't seen it, please join us and take a look. And I'd like to thank very much to our wonderful speakers today. Um, it's been great to, to listen to your ideas and the wonderful work that you're each of which one of you is doing. And thank you all for coming through the first snow of the year and being here um, to join us for this conversation. Thank you.